This week's video is sponsored by Ye Old Prop Shop. Between the Enchanted Tiki Room and the Polynesian Village Resort, Disney is no stranger to tiki culture, otherwise known by many as Polynesian Pop. How did this trend begin, where did it go, and why is it just so perfect for Disney? This is Ernest Raymond Gant. He was born in 1907 in Texas and raised in New Orleans, and as he grew up he would often help his grandfather who had a shipping business between the States and the Caribbean. This was the mid and late 1920s, so when I say shipping business, what I really mean is bootlegging. Ernest and his grandpa were bootleggers. When Ernest turned 18, he used money that was set aside for continued education to instead travel and explore not only the Caribbean that he had become so familiar with, but the South Pacific as well. In 1933, deciding to put his experiences to use, he opened a bar in Hollywood that was to be themed around his adventures, and he decorated the place with a wide variety of items that he had collected over the years while exploring. His drinks would be based on rum and have a Caribbean flair. Finally, referring to a name he allegedly used while bootlegging, he called the bar Don's Beachcomber Cafe, and it took off. You see, up until that point, places that acknowledged Polynesia did so in a pretty minimal way. They'd use one or two icons of the South Pacific, but it was largely still familiar American dining, music, and drinks. Then comes along Don's Beachcomber Cafe, decorated with all sorts of items from the region, and featuring these seemingly exotic drinks that people weren't used to. It was different and exciting, and as the Great Depression kicked off, it was for many the only way to experience a tropical getaway. Eventually, Ernest would move locations and rename the venue to Don the Beachcombers, and with its success, he would also rename himself. Ernest Gaunt would from then on be known as Don Beach. With its rise in popularity, it wouldn't be long until other similarly themed bars would begin to spring up. One of the most popular would be opened by a man named Victor Bergeron Jr. As the story goes, Victor didn't have the same wealth of Polynesian items that Don had when it came to his own bar, which was known at the time as Hinky Dinks. So instead of sailing around the South Pacific for a few years, he instead would trade free drinks for those who would bring him items. This would earn him a nickname, and he would use that nickname to rebrand Hinky Dinks into what would then be known as Trader Vicks. Later, Vic would go on to invent the Mai Tai in 1944, which would eventually become the cocktail that symbolized the pop culture movement. Just a year later, in 1945, another important event would occur, the end of World War II. Hundreds of thousands of US troops had spent years in Polynesia, stationed on islands like Hawaii and Bora Bora. The downtime between battles allowed service members to experience the local cultures of the South Pacific. So when they began to come home at the end of the war, they brought with them stories of the Pacific Isles. In 1947, one person in particular, James Michener, wrote a book from those experiences called Tales of the South Pacific. The book was so popular that just two years later it would be adopted by Rodgers and Hammerstein into a musical of the same name, and nine years after that the musical would be adapted into a feature film. Another interesting trend was occurring in the US at the same time. All of these troops coming home and wanting to settle down led to an explosion in suburban development, and along with it came a shift towards white-collar professions, giving us the 9 to 5 we all know today. That last part is important because the tiki culture would serve as the perfect escape. It put emphasis on the beautiful natural settings, the slower pace of living, and an all-around more carefree lifestyle which was the antithesis of the fast-moving and fast-growing post-war industrial spirit of the United States. Now it sounds like I'm jumping around a bit, but ultimately these were all ingredients that would come together to turn tiki culture into a nationwide craze. Over the following decade, tiki culture exploded in popularity. Families across the country began hosting backyard luau's, Thanks to artists like Martin Denny and Les Baxter, the exotica music genre climbed the charts, giving people a soundtrack for the paradise they hoped to escape to. And tiki bars like Don's and Vic's started popping up everywhere. Even Hollywood leaned into tiki culture with films like Blue Hawaii and Paradise Hawaiian Style, and TV shows like Gilligan's Island and Hawaiian Eye. In 1962, the craze would finally make its way to Disneyland with the opening of the Tahitian Terrace, a Polynesian-styled restaurant. 
and just a year after that, the classic and now famous Enchanted Tiki Room would open to the public, featuring the very first audio animatronics. In a way, it was a perfect match for Disney. To put it simply, Tiki culture was never an accurate portrayal of Polynesian culture. From the very beginning with Don the Beachcombers, it was a mashup of different elements of different islands into one singular idea of what that Polynesian lifestyle was like. Even the name, Tiki, was generalized. Tiki was originally a specific figure in Maori mythology who was represented by wooden carvings. By the height of the craze, it was just a catch-all word that embodied the lifestyle as a whole. Exotica music was less of a recreation of actual Polynesian music and more of an original attempt to create music that might be considered tropical. In short, tiki culture was about taking all of the idealized and romanticized aspects of multiple cultures and leaving out the rest, which was exactly what Walt was doing over at Disneyland. So what happened to tiki culture? Well, the short answer is that like many other pop culture trends, it eventually just faded away. As the 1960s came to a close, the baby boomers were coming of age, and like virtually every generation of young people, they rejected a lot of the cultural norms of their parents. They were a generation that desired more authenticity that tiki culture just couldn't provide. With a socially conscious eye, many saw tiki culture to be, at best, tacky and at worst, offensive. And as the country became involved with the Vietnam conflict, many young people, facing the prospects of being shipped off to war, found it hard to look at the tropical settings as an escape. Sure, Vietnam wasn't technically in Polynesia, but the visuals were close enough to push people away. And so tiki culture would lie relatively dormant over the following few decades until it would see somewhat of a self-aware resurgence in the 1990s. But in at least one place, it was going to be making an earlier comeback. Walt Disney World. As 1971 was fast approaching, Disney was hard at work constructing the initial phase of Walt Disney World. Among a larger East Coast version of Disneyland called the Magic Kingdom, Disney World was also planned to offer a slew of recreational activities as well as multiple themed resorts. While the plan ultimately called for five themed resorts, they began the project focusing on just two. One was a slick modern called the Contemporary, the other was a South Pacific themed hotel called the Polynesian Village Resort. At the time where tiki culture was no longer popular, it might have seemed like an odd choice, but in a way it made perfect sense. The various lands at Disneyland up until that point, save for Tomorrowland for obvious reasons, were never about capturing the spirit of contemporary times. They were about idealizing the past. And so the fact that the culture was on the wane by the time the hotel would open wasn't a problem for Disney. It just meant that it was yet another faded memory for guests to immerse themselves in at a place dedicated to such a goal. If you want to learn more about the history of the Polynesian Village Resort, check out my new video all about the hotel over at Disney Dan's YouTube channel. As I mentioned, it would eventually make a comeback in the 90s. This time it would carry a bit of a meta significance. While the original tiki culture craze was all about idealizing an escape to a tropical paradise, the resurgence of tiki represented not just that, but also idealizing the time in which the original tiki craze occurred. That resurgence would also end up making its way to the Disney resorts later on. In 2011, Trader Sam's Enchanted Tiki Bar would open at the Disneyland Resort, and a few years later, Trader Sam's Grog and Grotto would open at the Polynesian Village Resort in Walt Disney World. The two, while unique in their own ways, would be homages to the very tiki bars that started the craze nearly 80 years earlier. Today, tiki culture is kitschy, and while it originally fell out of favor for that very reason, that's part of what's given it a second win today. It came into existence at a time before Disneyland, and yet it still managed to share much of the same DNA that Walt's idyllic kingdom was built upon. It is a small but interesting slice of American pop culture history, and while it's not something you can find today as easily as you could in the 1960s, you'll have no problem spotting it at Disney. I want to thank Ye Old Prop Shop for sponsoring this week's video. Maybe you've decided that you want to add a little bit of Polynesian pop into your own home and that the signs from Disney's Polynesian Village Resort would be perfect. Well, you can't. Those signs are Disney's. You can't have them. What you can do, however, is purchase a recreation of those signs over at Ye Old Prop Shop. 
Beyond just the Polynesian, they offer all sorts of Disney signs, ranging from the Haunted Mansion, to the Tower of Terror, to the iconic plaques that greet you as you enter Main Street USA. They also offer customized signs. They sent me a really awesome Polynesian-themed Trader Rob sign that's going to be going up in my office. And if signs aren't your thing, they also offer coasters and ornaments. And guess what? Those ornaments can be customized too. Ye Old Prop Shop is a great way to bring a little bit of Disney into your home. If you'd like to learn more, you can find links in the description below, or you can visit yeoldpropshop.net or Ye Old Prop Shop on Etsy.